Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Lyndall Stout. We're continuing to visit county fairs around Oklahoma, and this week we've stopped in Old Mulgee County, where the fair's been going on for more than 100 years now. Organizers, of course, are busy getting ready for a fun week of exhibits and competition, and of course, lots of visitors. Meantime, we're talking about wheat and how your planting dates can impact the potential for diseases in your crop. Senup's Curtis Hare caught up with our extension wheat pathologist, Bob Hunger, to learn more. If your television screens are looking a little purple, that's completely normal because we are in the Wheat and Soils Lab with Extension Wheat Pathologist Bob Hunger. And Bob, tell us a little bit about what you have going on here. Well, this lab is, our, as you said, our soils lab. It's our dirty lab where we work with the samples we bring in. It's where we grow plants and that's why we have these growth lights in here. Uh, <clears throat> behind me over here are some plants that are just about fully mature that uh, we've been able to grow through the summer in this cool condition but then we also have the lights to develop them and then uh, closer here are some plants that we're growing now actually I'm growing these for use in a class that I teach uh, uh, host plant resistance and we also have some plants up front here that you can see are infected with powdery mildew <clears throat> and in this lab we grow these so that we have some of that inoculum we use to test the breeding lines as we go through the, the coming winter. Yeah, so it, um, and it's kind of hard to believe that wheat planting is already right around the corner. Um, for those producers who are trying to take advantage of dual <clears throat> purpose, uh, what's some of the optimum dates that they need to uh, start thinking about to take advantage of that? Well, uh, as, as Dr. Marburger mentioned a week or so ago, the optimum time for uh, a dual purpose wheat planting of that is around mid-September. For grain only, it's about a month later in mid-October. And uh, that planting date is, is very important for the wheat plant, but it also has a huge impact on the wheat diseases that can occur. Uh, that earlier planting date, uh, uh, allows there to be much more time uh, for diseases to infect the plants uh, but if you have that month or six weeks longer period of time it's much more likely that you'll get that infection. So uh, how about the rainfall? Some parts of the state have seen a lot of rainfall and some parts of the state haven't really seen that much. How does rainfall uh, you know, factor in with wheat disease and with those early planting dates? Well, it, it affects it by affecting the planting date. Uh, most, most producers won't plant until they have the soil moisture to support the plants. And of course, they're gonna have the soil moisture now once it dries out well enough to, that they can get into the field. So that soil moisture will be there, then they tend to get antsy and wanna get the, the wheat planted. And so then you tend to have an earlier planting date. And there's some measures that producers can take to kind of, you know, minimize the effect in regards to the seed, right? Sure. Uh, uh, not, not so much with the wheat streak mosaic virus and those mite transmitted viruses, but the planting date, like I say, leaves, if you plant later, that leaves a much shorter time for those infections to occur. And that can also affect the root rots a little bit too, that planting date. Now, seed treatments can help some as well, not with uh, wheat streak mosaic virus, but with uh, the aphid transmitted barley yellow dwarf because the seed treatment will, will help keep the plants free of aphids for at least several weeks up to maybe a month. Uh, and then it can also help with the root rots if it has a fungicide in it because that fungicide can suppress some of that early season root rots uh, that can infect the plants then. Uh, in regards to the seed treatments, uh, you have a current fact sheet report out. Yeah, there's a, a current report, 7088. Uh, it talks about the effect of planting date on the different wheat diseases on the root rots and on these viruses, barley yellow dwarf and the mite transmitted viruses. That's available through the extension system here at OSU. All right, thanks, Bob. If you would like a link to that fact sheet, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, corn, sorghum, and beans, relatively stable. Wheat, not so much. Let's start with that first group. Well, the uh, corn, uh, corn prices look around Oklahoma around $3.40 a bushel, go out in the panhandle around $3.75. Now, Milo is a little lower than the corn, uh, $3.25, both in the panhandle and around the state of Oklahoma. And soybeans is really in the tank, somewhere around $7.40 a bushel. What are your price expectations for corn, sorghum, and beans? Well, if you look at uh, corn, it's the second highest corn production on uh, record for both the United States and the world, but you, you've got record corn consumption in the U.S. and around the world and actually l projected lower ending stocks as we get out. And so I think there's some 
potential for higher corn prices. You look at Milo, that's just going to follow the corn prices, so some potential there for Milo too. But soybeans, soybeans is in the tank. You've got record U.S. wheat, uh, U.S. soybean production. You've got record world uh, soybean production. Uh, you do have record uh, world consumption of soybeans, but you've still got record ending stocks projected. So. I don't think there's much hope for soybean prices right now. And then, of course, you've got the China trade uh, tiff uh, that I call it. My, my worry about the Chinese deal is like you go back into the 70s when uh, President Nixon put on the price freeze, everybody held their commodities till the prices came off the freeze. Anticipating higher prices, they went in the tank. I'm afraid that uh, people are going to hold their soybeans, our farmers will hold the soybeans, They're, the Chinese deal are going to have some agreement with U.S., and then everybody's going to sell their beans and prices are going lower. So I'm really uh, skeptical about higher soybean prices, but I'm semi-positive for corn and milo. Now wheat, I understand, has really taken a beating and uh, recently, what's going on there? Well, it's just reacted to what's going on in, in Russia. You know, one week uh, they're going to limit exports. The next day they're not going to limit exports. You get 25 to 50 cent price moves just on that. Uh, I think until we get some stability there, I, I look at the supply and demand situation, I'm, I'm positive for higher wheat prices. Finally, you and our friends in Ag Economics have a new colleague. Yes, Dr. Amy Hangerman. Uh, she comes to us from USDA, and I think she's going to be a good addition to our de department for the, our policy specialist. Great, and we want to welcome her to SUNUP this week as well to explain some changes with how the USDA is classifying cotton. Yeah, so there are some important changes that happened with the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 that are important for our cotton producers in Oklahoma. Historically, cotton has had generic base acres, or at least in the 2014 Farm Bill. That's actually going to go away. And now they're either going to have seed cotton acres, which is cotton with both the lint and the seed, ungen cotton, or it's going to become unassigned base. So producers have some important upcoming deadlines that they're going to need to meet for their transforming their generic base into seed cotton base, other crops base or unassigned base. If they don't elect to make one of these selections, then they're gonna fall into the default for either an ARC or a PLC election. So if they choose not to take action between now and December 7th, they are going to have their generic base broken into 80% seed cotton, 20% unassigned, which is not eligible for payments and they will go to the default of PLC. So if they'd like to have their choice, if they'd like to make a choice between ARC and PLC, and perhaps to have a choice of how they would like those acres to be broken up, now is the time for them to act. Uh, they have until September 28th to make the first contact with their state, their county FSA office to uh, start determining how they're going to roll over those generic acres, but they have until December 7th to sign their contracts. So they've got plenty of time to get in and talk uh, to their, their FSA agent, but it's never too late to start. So this is gonna primarily impact the 2000, the coming crop year. As of right now, we don't know of anything in the talks around the farm bill that would say producers could change that acreage election when they change their base acres in the next farm bill. So for right now, producers need to assume that whatever choice they make in terms of breaking up their acreage is going to be a permanent decision. Um, once we have a farm bill, a 2018 farm bill, then we'll know more if they would be able to make some adjustments in their base acres for different commodities. This is nationwide, so every cotton producer in the country is going to be making this decision in this time frame, um, but generic acres are completely going away. So it's all going to go into some other commodity, whether that's seed cotton, wheat, for example, in Oklahoma might be a common choice, or into unassigned. Um, and, and that means that there are going to be resources available from all over the country as producers make these decisions. There is no telling what will happen in the next farm bill. Um, we don't know what will come out related to cotton. Based on the provisions in the Bipartisan Budget Act, however, this is going to be a, a permanent decision in terms of producers making decisions on their seed cotton acres. Hello, Wesley here with your weekly Mesonet weather report. 
The arrival of September has seen the impact of tropical moisture that delivered to us some impressive rain amounts. The three-day rainfall map for September the 5th shows almost the entire state received rainfall. The central part of the state received the highest totals with over three inches recorded in parts of Jefferson, Stevens, McLean, and Osage counties. Cocoraz, a citizen reported rainfall system, indicated that parts of Cleveland County near Noble received over five and a half inches during the same period of time. There is now adequate shallow soil moisture for germination over most of the state as indicated in this September 4th map of four inch fractional soil moisture. Here a one indicates the soil is fully saturated at the sensor depth. This much needed rain and the cooler weather associated with it has also lowered soil temperatures to a range more suitable for wheat germination. Seeds planted into soil with temperatures above 85 degrees Fahrenheit may result in delayed germination. On September 5th, the 1 p.m. soil temperatures were mostly in the high 70s and low 80s over most of the major wheat growing region. I expect wheat planting for forage will begin in earnest as soon as soils are dry enough. Now Gary is here to discuss more on the long-term moisture situation. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well we've gotten more good rains across the state, at least most of the state, and so we've had more drought removal. The drought map is looking better and better each week. Let's take a look at this week's map and see where we're at. As you can see a large swath of that good white color from the panhandle all the way down through uh, far southeastern Oklahoma up into east central Oklahoma. We still have those two core areas of drought, however, in southwest Oklahoma. So those are the two areas where we need some really focused rainfall to knock out this drought once and for all across the entire state. If we look at the rains over the last 60 days, we see lots of great orange and red colors on the Mesonet map. The greens and yellows, uh, light oranges, those are the places where we need rainfall to help knock out this drought. We can see that is obviously across southeast Oklahoma. Again, that area in the central panhandle looks pretty bad. It's still almost 150 percent, so not bad out there, but we see those areas with yellows, but we see those areas with the lighter colors, so down in the southwest, those are the areas that we need rainfall and we need it to relieve that drought so we can have a completely drought-free map by the time we get to fall and planting season. Now if we go back to the beginning of spring, uh, sometime around the first couple of weeks of March, where are we now? Well, the drought monitor change map for the last six months, we can see those dark blue colors across the northwestern part of the state. That's where we had exceptional drought. So lots of great changes over the last six months, but we still have a ways to go. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Planted acres of cotton have expanded again this year into areas that have not seen cotton in decades. Today we learn from a Noble County producer why he's incorporating cotton into his system. Well, this is our second year growing cotton. We put together about a thousand, 900 to 1,000 acres last year, and this year I think we got close to 1,200 acres. At first we kind of thought, wow, we're, we're really going to try this. and. Uh, so we went ahead and jumped off the deep end and we, we all planted some and uh, worked out really good for us. And it kind of fits in the rotation really good. It, it puts a little bit later going back to wheat, but I think it was still all right in the rotation. And uh, I think we're gonna continue to do it. It's been a lot more profitable than any anything we've been doing. Last year it was. And uh, you know this year we got a lot better crop this year. And I think that it's gonna be even more profitable this year. There's always been a, a, a a crop or two in here but it's not been very big not covering a lot of acres but in the last couple years they've increased the crop from uh, nearly to a thousand acres somewhere along in there we don't have very much cotton in here the next thing is is where do we where do we send it to crop scouting is definitely something that all of us didn't know nothing about we didn't know anything about the insect problems when it's bearing fruit uh, the input costs are about the same as your corn the only thing is then you've got another 90, 100 bucks an acre on top of that on harvesting. I think our harvester is 14 cents a pound. We harvest it all with a uh, picker baler is what they used last year. And it puts it in an eight by eight round bale module. And then we have 
uh, drop deck trailers that we load it on and ship it to Anthony. Cotton is more of a, of a manager's type of crop. You just can't plant it and go away and wait till harvest. You, you need to scout it and sometimes several times a week. Uh, there's insects, there's weeds, and then defoliation when it comes time to harvest. Cotton compared to wheat, uh, it's just so far has been way more profitable. Definitely a lot more time consuming than wheat. You know, the wheat, you kind of set it out there and make sure you keep it clean and keep it sprayed. And the cotton, you just keep spraying. You definitely need to invest in a decent sprayer. It's definitely a spraying, time consuming spraying crop. I think the way, as good as the this rotation is working right now, I think that it'll continue to happen with us few neighbors that are doing it now. I think that we'll continue to have it in our program until price comes to where we don't think it's beneficial to plan. Seth, the producer there in Noble County, he's, he's, this is his second year to produce cotton in northern Oklahoma. It's not really an area that's, that's used to seeing cotton production. Kind of talk about the expansion of cotton acres north and into dryland areas. Yeah, and so we're seeing a lot of new acres, new, fairly new. They, you know, they may have cotton there 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right. uh, but haven't recently. And we're seeing a lot of that in that northern area. And I guess we commonly refer to it as the, the north of I-40 part of Oklahoma. Uh, and it is a lot of dryland. And you know, I know there's a lot of rotation uh, options there are, are they're trying to fit that in part of a rotation with wheat and so hopefully we can get a lot of the cotton out in the next you know 90 days and maybe get wheat in behind it in, in a timely manner and make that rotation really work for those folks that are they're going to try it. This year has been an interesting year with weather here we are the in, in the middle of, of September clouds rain depending on where you are in the state yeah. how has that the the different types of weather how has that impacted the cotton crop across the state? Yeah so Statewide, we were hot and dry. Right. Now, uh, the southwest corner was kind of the extreme hot and dry. Uh, we look elsewhere and we, we're talking about the new acres, so I'm going to kind of focus on that area. Uh, we did have a, a pretty warm, dry summer, and so we had timely rain. Uh, it wasn't a lot of it, but it came at the right time, and that's key for cotton. We'd rather have five or six inches that we can kind of map out and put it where we want it than just 10 or 12 inches that we just get in two or three days. Fiber maturity, fiber development is a, is a photosynthetic process, so it requires not only water, but sunlight and heat. And so we would really like to see our, our heat units a little bit higher than they are, uh, at least in this short-term period we're in right now where we're, we're a little cloudy and, and cooler. Uh, we're getting fairly close. Producers are gonna start thinking about uh, harvest aids. When, when, when should producers start doing the applications for those? So. We usually try to time harvest aids around crop status. So we look at percent open bowls. Uh, so we want to go between 60 and 70 percent open. Uh, or one of my favorite methods is nodes above crack bowl. And so it's four nodes between your uppermost cracked bowl and your uppermost harvestable bowl. And so the key thing on, on any harvest aid timing or scheduling, we only want to take into account our harvestable bowl loads. If we have a white flower that opens today, and it's got a little bitty bowl out there three weeks from now, I'm not gonna count on that bowl opening. So I need to take that bowl out of my equation. So we also do have a Oklahoma cotton harvest aid guide coming out. We're gonna cover not just the when do we spray and, and how do we time that, but also the products, what the products do, what they don't do, uh, and then some issues. We talk about rain, could this lead to regrowth? And, and there's some you know thoughts in there on how to handle regrowth, what to do, and, and, and really what not to do. And so hopefully that'll give some folks some, some help and some resources to, to make those decisions when it comes time to spray their fields. Okay, thank you much, Seth Bird. And for a link to that, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. October's the time of the start of the fall value-added calf sales. That means that the weaning dates are just around the corner. In fact, the first weaning date for an OQBN sale is actually next week. The time frame between when those calves are weaned and when they're going to the sale in October is a critical time in terms of the profitability of this preconditioning program that the rancher is involved in with with those value-added calves. Making sure that those calves continue to gain from weaning until sale date is critical. And we think that the uh, a proper amount of rate of gain is about a pound and a half to two pounds per head per day. 
That means that these calves need to have a good growing diet as they uh, go through the weaning process until sale date. There's uh, op obviously different options that are available. Some may use a self-feeder where uh, they have a mixed ration for the calves to consume. Others may hand feed a supplement in addition to whatever forage is available for the calves. Whatever that diet is, it needs to be to where the total diet is at least 12 and a half, 13 percent crude protein. There is help available for you in terms of determining what might be the best feeding program for your calves in your uh, value-added calf program. Go to the SUNUP website. Look under show links. We've got a link there to a fact sheet. It's basically uh, it's management and nutrition for preconditioning home-raised beef calves. It's got a lot of good information about how to get these calves started and several suggested diets for the calves, whether they're real lightweight young calves or whether they're more traditional uh, weights in terms of being 400, 600 pounds at weaning time. Several diets there that you can put together uh, with your feed dealer and have the appropriate kind of feed for those calves to gain that one and a half to two pounds per head per day and do the best job of returning the most dollars for your investment in terms of the a vaccine program as well as the feed that's uh, required for those calves to receive uh, the one and a half to two pounds per head per day. We think it's a critical that you have those calves on a good diet so that they continue to gain and grow between weaning and sale date to make this value-added calf program work for you. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. Wheat producers will be planting that seed later in the month, and, and Misha, there's some things that those producers can be doing now and in the near future to help prevent weeds throughout the growing season. Yes, we have some herbicides that can be applied shortly after planting. Um, I like to call this growth stage around spiking, right when you see emergence of your crop. Um, the primary target weed that we're looking at for this active ingredient is Italian ryegrass. So if you're a producer who wants to make the investment in grass weed control, which a lot of our grain only systems are interested in, um, then this is a product that can go out. The active ingredients, pyroxysulfone, and there's two trade names labeled in wheat, Zidua and Anthem Flex. Now, are we gonna see any type of control differences in a, say, a no-till field versus a conventional till field? Yes, so with these pre-emergence products, um, Herbicide to soil contact is very important, mm -hmm. as well as a rain to get that herbicide where we want it in the soil profile. Mm -hmm. So we need to be strategic when we're applying. We want a rain to be coming shortly after application. If we have residue on the ground, um, we need to be thinking about increasing our carrier volumes to really push that herbicide past the residue. Um, and we will be getting better contact in more of a conventional tilled environment. Um, and if the, if the ryegrass does come up and that window's just mixed, we do have some post-emergence products that can go out. We've seen some inconsistencies in Oklahoma with some of the post products, and I just recommend that application timing, making sure that ryegrass doesn't get too big, can go a long way. Talk, talk about some of the, uh, the, the weed management options for those producers that, that are gonna run cattle on their wheat. Yeah, so if you're not investing in grass weed management, mm -hmm. um, we can still be thinking about our broadleafs. Right. We, we like to say that, you know, if we're forage only, we're gonna go out in the spring when we top dress. But if you have a broadleaf that comes up in the fall that starts competing, I highly recommend getting out earlier. That investment and that second pass can go a long ways in control. Weed control is important to to wheat production or, or winter crop production. Talk about how important that can be. Yeah, I think for almost any producer, no matter what they're growing, they're gonna rate weed management as one of their top concerns, um, especially as we have herbicide resistance, it's a challenge. So our weeds are competing with our crops for water, nutrients, and light, and they can also be detrimental to our, our quality. Right. So for grain, Italian ryegrass, that's gonna be dockage that we see um, and money lost when we're at the mill. So incredibly important.
Okay, thank you very much, Misha. And for more information on weed management tools, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. On May 18th, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture confirmed the presence of virulent Newcastle disease in California. Now this is the first case of Newcastle disease that we have had in the United States since 2002. Uh, we had it, infections in some backyard poultry and in some commercial productions in a few states. That ended up costing the United States about $395 million to clean up. So far, the Newcastle cases that have been found in California have all been in backyard flocks. No commercial flocks have been in, infected and it has been confined to the state of California. Now Newcastle disease is one of the most important poultry diseases in the world. Chickens are very susceptible to the disease. The virus survives for long periods of time in the environment, especially in moist, cold conditions. The virus is spread by the movement of chickens. It, once a chicken is infected, uh, it usually takes two days to maybe two weeks before you're going to see clinical signs. There is no treatment for the disease, so preventing it is important. Uh, there is a vaccine available. Uh, it does not prevent infection, it only reduces clinical signs. If you would like some more information about biosecurity and about Newcastle disease, just go to sunup at okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. From the Okmulgee County Free Fair, I'm Lyndall Stout. Remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.